I'll start with biocidin because I like that too. I use it a lot. And this is where I see if we go back to our little spectrum of on the left, we got normal and in the middle, we've got kind of, okay, these are not good for us, but they're not as big as the stuff on the right. So the phase one and two, and they have different formulations and stuff. But the way that I've seen them work is definitely across the spectrum of phase one and into phase two, they cross over in there. And so one tell clinically is if somebody tried biocide and just sort of, they saw, oh, this might be a good idea. And then they had this wicked reaction. You know, there's, there's a biofilm problem because they went and they poked it and they probably didn't have all the prep and all that stuff. Okay. So biocidin is certainly, it's a great place to start for people because especially if you do all the preparatory stuff and all that, or you work with someone who does that, you can, the biocidin will be very helpful. Also, because these things can cause problems like in the oral areas, you can do their topical stuff and, you know, all of, all of that. I always tell people to start surface. The other one that you'll see, which I'm sure you've heard too, is, okay, they do, do an oral thing and things blow up. Well, then get help before you go to your gut. But like they'll do a sinus treatment as a lot of biofilms up in the sinuses and they might do a nasal spray. There's prescription ones, but also small part per million silver. So not colloidal silver, but silver hydrosols like at 23, 25 part per million. They are known biofilm disruptors, but I've had people do them, you know, and they're up the nose, maybe the first dose, maybe the first couple of days of doses, and all of a sudden they feel systemically ill. It's the same as that dental effect you were talking about. You have just unleashed biofilms that have communication with your bloodstream that you didn't realize how bad it was up here. And almost in every case, if the dental stuff lights up or sinuses light up, you need to stop, do lots of prep, before you do anything with the gut. Okay, so I think that's a really good cautionary tale too. But yeah, starting there is great. So beyond biocidin, which is, I always feel like it's more of a, it's almost like a a broad team player. Like you can kind of start there and see what kind of response you get. There's other formulas that, these were some of the ones that we were like, well, they probably work with the, you know, lower level ones, but they kind of run into literal wall with the bigger ones. And you'll see older mixtures that might have like EDTA and them, which is a chelator, but also chelators and biofilms don't get along well. So they would put that in it or enzymes or other stuff. Those are great, you know, the high enzyme con- and with the EDT, but they kind of stop working when you get to these bigger skyscraper kinds. Now they don't call them that in the research, but when you look at advanced phase two biofilms, and this goes, this is 20 plus years of research. Now, what they found worked the best was to bond two things that nobody had thought of bonding before to make a a wedge that works better. And so they took two common things, one being a certain type of bismuth, so bismuth and Pepto-Bismol and stuff. There's a different kind of bismuth that's a little stronger than the one in Pepto-Bismol, but actually Pepto-Bismol on its own is a biofilm disruptor, but bismuth subnitrite and then a thiol. Thiols are sulfury molecules. So you did like alpha lipoic acid and N acetylcysteine and glutathione. Those are all thiols, right? But at the level of, oh no, we gave you a bad biofilm in surgery or in the war or whatever, you know, the worst of the worst, they don't take a, a monothiol like the ones I just mentioned. They take a dithiol and they react the two, the bismuth and the thiol. They form a bisthiol complex. Complex. So they're no longer two molecules, they're, they're one. The reason that this works is that once those two molecules come together, they're very tightly bound and they actually will stick into the matrix of the biofilm and be a wedge and not move. And then they start to open, and obviously it's more than one, starts to open the hive up. Now, when I was, because we had patients who were extremely sick and we weren't getting anywhere with, you know, all the stuff we were using, or we would run into a wall with biocidin and we knew we we had more to do because biofilms were still a problem. So when I was researching this, there was nothing made except for the government. And so I got all their original papers and I looked and I found all of the forms of bismuth they liked, which were easy to get those anywhere, well, in any pharmacy, and then all of the dithiols. And I looked at the top two, three, four, because at the time I was also doing research and I had connections with these great pharmacy suppliers and all. I called all my friends and I'm like, can you get me this? And they're like, yeah, sure. And they call back and they're like, no, there's no supply of that. Can you get me 
number two or number three. Oh yeah, though that's easy. Two years ago, no problem. All gone. All of it is sequestered by the government for the military. So what I did is I just kept going down the list to, to there's still strong stuff. And so if, if you look at my summary paper that I wrote for pharmacies of how to make, you know, the generic version of a, a, a BT drug, you're either using a DMPS or DMSA, which are chelators, but they're not chelating so much anymore as they're binding to the bismuth subnitrite and they make a really strong wedge. Because it was like, we tried this on a lot of patients before we made this public, but then people started asking me and I, so I just put it in the public domain. Well, then I found out that there is at least one, maybe two companies who had been doing most of this research and were building designer drugs for the government for biofilms, right? So initially I ran into an old colleague. I didn't realize he was an advisor for one of these companies. And he said, I hear you've been working on biofilms. Tell me what you know. And I said, oh, and, uh, and he says, hmm. he says, you won't be able to find these papers but I'm going to give you a way to find them. So I looked up and that's when I found the papers that were all about the chemistry. They've made them very difficult to find. Well, then about a year later, I made it public and it was in the public domain. And so one of the original researchers got very upset with me and all this stuff. Well, then I ran into my friend again from industry and he says, don't worry about it. He says, our drugs that we have developed are so far beyond what you put in the public domain that you know no one's going to see you don't worry about it. so thank thank god for that because i could have gotten in a lot of trouble i've made that in the public domain it's on my website if you i think if you search by well. the hub website is dranow.com d-r-a-n-o-w and there's a sublink to my doctor website which is consult dr a and if you just search biofilm it's the first or second thing it says biofilm handout and it tells you safety but it tells pharmacies how to make this stuff